Hey everyone, welcome to Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences video podcast. I am Heather Hoops Matthews here in the studio today and being joined remotely first by Lauren DeMoss, a healthcare attorney in the Maynard Nexon Birmingham office. Lauren, good to be with you. Thanks so much, Heather. Great to be here. And we are joined today by another Maynard Nexon lawyer, Jim Poole. Now, Jim specializes in providing strategic organizational payment tax and compliance advice, in addition to all types of health care providers. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Since you do a lot and you have so much experience, let's start with a framework for this discussion. Tell us what it means to be a tax exempt entity. Sure. So since, since this is kind of a healthcare focused podcast, let me just back up and give the overall view of tax exempt entities, since that's not something everybody's dealing with all the time. Um, under the Internal Revenue Code, there's probably more than 30 different kinds of tax exempt entities from cemetery holding companies to social welfare organizations, which have really become de facto political organizations, to what we generally think of, and that is the 501c3 charities. Um, and so, and that's more what most of us ta- folks that do tax exempt work deal with is the 501c3 entities. Um, a, a 501c3 is generally created as a nonprofit under state law. And then once it's created, the entity then files an application with the IRS to be recognized as a 501c3. And an interesting piece of that that, that can matter is that The way the code, the IRS code, the Internal Revenue Code works is you are described in Section 501c3, but you have to be recognized by the service. So what that means is, let's say we created a a new nonprofit entity today, and tomorrow we file the application with the service. The service is very backlogged. It will likely be months before we hear from them and get our letter of determination. The, The determination letter, though, will say that we've been exempt since... January 5th, the date we were formed, or late back because we've been described in that section the whole time, as long as you file that application in a timely manner. Um, So that that creates interesting issues. You have people wanting to make donations to that entity, but you can't give them a determination letter. So you got to think about how to do that. It's got it. um, It just creates lots of interesting other issues that go along with with uh, being a tax exempt entity. One other piece to note that relates to the healthcare part is Under 501c3, there are two kinds of tax exempt entities, basically. Private foundations, generally they are funded by a company or a family, one company or one family or two. And because of that arrangement, they are much more heavily regulated than the rest of the 501c3 world and the public charity part, because there's nobody outside the public watching them, just a family. On the public charity side, there's several different kinds of public charities. The one we often think of is entities that are publicly funded. That is, they raise their money from the public. They have events and they send out fundraising letters and that kind of thing. But there's also particular types of entities that if they're operated in a certain way are public charities, one of which is hospitals. So a hospital that follows some certain rules can be a tax exempt entity. And I, I will say with regard to that, that's been a co- an intermittent uh, source of consternation in Congress and in the public. Um, there were revenue rulings issued back in the 60s trying to say how taxes and hospitals should act that would differentiate them from taxable hospitals. The Affordable Care Act put in, in 2010, put in a new section 501R that puts some specific requirements on taxes and hospitals. And this year, there have been congressional hearings trying to decide, should we do more to push taxes and hospitals to show that they are deserving of that benefit? 501c3 entities get two tax benefits. They're not taxed, and also they can receive deductible contributions. So there's a lot of regulations that that govern how they, they act. Um, uh, and that that are part of what I do in terms of helping them stay in compliance um, during during their existence. You know, Jim, you're obviously very well known as a healthcare attorney, but you've got this tax exempt kind of subspecialty part of your practice. I guess it'd be interesting for folks to hear kind of how those two, how the tax exempt practices interacts with the healthcare practice and specific ways those two kind of come together when you're advising clients. Yeah, it happens in lots of different ways. It's a great thing to to consider. Um, When I first started practicing law a long time ago, um, I was brought into our firm at first 
with a focus in securities and tax. And the particular area of tax that I was asked to uh, work in is 501c3. And I was, we didn't have somebody doing that. We had general tax people, but so I was asked to become our 501c3 guy. So as I did that um, and began developing that, um, I was working with a tax exempt hospital. And very quickly, it became clear that there was a, and and we didn't have, this was be- really before there were lots of healthcare practices around. We didn't have that either. So those, I grew up in both those worlds kind of simultaneously. The, the healthcare world was developing then. Uh, there were the, the brand new regulations came out under the anti-kickback statute soon after I'd started practicing. The Stark Law was passed not long after that. So there was there was a lot of, of coming together of those two worlds for me in particular. In terms of the practice, uh, there are there are obviously lots of for-profit healthcare entities out there, and I do a lot of work for them too. In the tax exempt side, though, um, a couple things go on. One is because they're both heavily regulated areas, lots of times when they're entering into, into any kind of transaction or arrangement, both areas will come up. And so you've got to answer questions in both those areas. And I think that's part of still what I'm doing today. We have a lot of healthcare people that are not tax exempt people. So we've got to, we've got to figure out a way to put those things together. Um, and then there are just really interesting things that come along. We, we did a deal several years ago where we, where we did a joint venture between a tax exempt hospital system and a for-profit hospital system. All kinds of issues to deal with that because the tax exempt system is still in place and wants to be tax exempt, but it's in a joint venture with the for profit system. So, um, they, in the kind of day to day world, if you represent a tax exempt uh, system, there will be tax exempt questions that come up every day, just like there's healthcare regulatory questions that come up every day. And it's, it's, I have found it's really helpful to have both those things on your radar as you're working with those entities. And so it was doable to have a joint venture between a taxable hospital and one that's tax exempt? Uh, Yes, yes. There are there are specific uh, revenue rulings out there that you do your best to follow. um, Yeah. uh, And uh, yeah, uh, you know, so far it's doable. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Um, What about common uh, misunderstandings, misperceptions or any special considerations about this area with healthcare? One thing that happened, there was a, a real interesting conflict that happened in that time when the Stark Law and then the then came back statute safe harbors were rolling out and the Stark Law was being uh, put in place. And they wanted, the, part of the goal of those things was not being in a position to reward somebody for, for referrals, just putting it on, not, not paying somebody mm-hmm. to get the referrals. On the tax exempt side, for example, here, here's what's occurring to me. Let's say a hospital system wants to recruit a physician to come to their area. On the tax exempt side, they want to be sure that the tax exempt hospital is not paying money uh, and not getting something in return. So they would want to, the, the tax exempt world early on was talking about, well, let's be sure that we're putting controls over this physician we just recruited to keep them in the area. So the hospital that's paying the money to help get them to the area is getting the benefit. Well, if you do that wrong, you've just violated Stark and any kickback. So you have this tension between those. That's that kind of thing tends to get worked out, and you kind of figure out ways to navigate that. But that's why being aware of both of those um, areas is is can be important when you're working with a system mm-hmm. that is tax exempt and a healthcare entity. Mm-hmm. You know, Jim, switching gears just a little bit to something more specific and kind of um, current. But there's been a lot of discussion recently about the new Corporate Transparency Act. And I think about those requirements and how they relate to tax exempt entities. Are there some special considerations there that you would advise folks on? You know, the worry about the Corporate Transparency Act that's been being talked about is that gap that I was talking about when you create an entity and it doesn't find out that it's recognized as an exempt entity for several months. Does that mean it's now got to file and, and, it's, and it meets the other requirements under the Corporate Transparency Act, because that means it's, it's got to file its report. The Corporate Transparency Act yeah, has several exemptions in there, and one of those is for tax exempt entities, but you've got this gap. Um, I think that it is clear in that act that if you, what it basically says is if you are 
a 501c3 without regard to 501, I mean, with, without regard to 508, 508 is a section that says you've got to file for this uh, recognition, then you are exempt. So it that one should shake out. So we don't have that problem, but that that was an immediate problem that we had because of this gap that every single exempt entity experiences where there be a lot of these uh, applications or these uh, information filings being made when in fact they wouldn't be required as soon as they get the determination letter. Yeah, that's it, definitely a nuance here. And I, I think if if anything, all of this tells tells our listeners, if you're a tax exempt healthcare entity, you need good counsel. You need you need someone helping you kind of navigate the intersection of two kind of highly regulated worlds and 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 what you can and can't do. And it is, I will say too, it is, you know, the when you put tax, in my experience, when you put the tax exempt overlay with the healthcare overlay, you really do have, uh, again, in my world, really good people trying to do the right thing and get the job done in an efficient way that's that's achieving their goals. Um, and and so it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be helping them through. But it is, uh, neither of those systems, the healthcare system or the tax system makes kind of intuitive sense. If something makes sense to you, it probably means you might be violating something because they just they just don't they just don't intuitively make sense. So it's it's rewarding to be able to help people through those because generally speaking, there's a right way to do it and you can get it done. And a couple of those words that you mentioned, stark anti kickback, when you violate those, that that's a really painful and expensive uh, pain point. Is that right? Absolutely, it can be. Yes, um, they're, yeah. they're, um, the stark is the the strict liability law, if you violate that law, you, you're, you've got big problems immediately. The anti-kickback statute is the more intent-based law, and you um, you have to decide if you have arguments if you fail to meet a safe harbor or have some provision that's been challenged under, under what you've done there. In the tax-exempt world, um, you, you can run into similar problems, not, not similar in terms of the kinds of violation, but similar kind of issues of if you have you, tax exempt entities have to file an annual report like a tax return on Form 990, and failure to do that appropriately can lead to penalties and interest because tax exempt entities, for example, a tax exempt health system may well have for profit things that it does, which is permissible. It just has to pay tax on those for profit things that it does. And and if it and if it doesn't file the appropriate form and pay the appropriate taxes, like every other taxpayer, it's subject to penalties and refunds and all that. Um, if and if it, if it has too much for-profit work, then it can that can endanger its tax exempt status. So all that has to be monitored um, uh, throughout the life of a tax exempt entity. Again, a good point for good counsel. <laughs> Jim Poole, thank you so much for joining us on behalf of Lauren and the whole Taking the Pulse team. We appreciate you stopping your day uh, and sharing a little bit about your lifelong career expertise in this area as it's evolved, really being a pioneer uh, for that here at Maynard Nexon. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys. And for those of you who joined us today on this podcast, we hope you learned a little bit more about healthcare entities and the um, tax exempt status, the pitfalls and the benefits of that and doing a good work for the right reason. We look forward to seeing you next time right here on Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences video podcast.